Okay, today we are going to talk about chemical bonding. Um, however, if you are watching this video to get ahead, um, you don't need to watch it. We're actually going to do this one in class this year uh, when we come back from break on Monday or Tuesday. So if you're just watching this to get ahead, um, stop now. We're going to do it in class. If you're watching it as review or if you are absent, um, continue on. Okay, so this whole unit six, we're going to talk about chemical bonding and this is going to serve as our introduction to chemical bonding and kind of the big groups. Now chemical bonds exist because atoms rarely exist alone. We don't find lone atoms. And when atoms are bonded together they have less potential energy and they are more stable. So therefore the atoms are happier. And again the lower the energy the more stable they are and the happier they are. How do atoms lower their energy? Well, they lose, gain, or share electrons to obtain a noble gas electron configuration. And for the most part, that means a full P6 sublevel. Okay? Um, it's, you know, there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, it's a full P6 sublevel. And that's why we talked about valence electrons and how many there are, particularly with the S and the Ps. All right, formal fancy definition of chemical bond is a mutual electrical attraction between the nuclei, which are positively charged because they have the protons, and the valence electrons, which are negatively charged, of different atoms that helps bind the atoms together. Okay, so it's this whole proton-electron attraction. Now, for ionic bonds, and we've seen these terms before, um, ionic bonds result from the electrical attraction between large numbers of cations that are positively charged and anions that are negatively charged. And the big reason I had us learn these terms earlier in the year is because now they're really important. And so electrons are transferred between atoms. Okay, so you actually get an electron to be donated to something else. Now covalent bonds result from the sharing of electron pairs between two atoms. Okay, and the electrons shared technically belong to both atoms. And here are just some diagrams of what some of this looks like, where you kind of show these kind of ball and stick figures, where the electrons are floating around between all of these circles or atoms that overlap. Now here's the thing, they don't always share equally. Okay, when you have a polar covalent bond, right? Polar means extremes, think of the North and South Pole, those things, these are when electrons are shared unevenly. So if you think back to last unit, we talked about electronegativity. We're going to talk about electronegativity here in just a minute again. Electronegativity is the ability to attract electrons when they're in a compound. So if the electronegativity difference is too large, this side over here is going to essentially win the tug of war this side of the atom is going to be negatively charged, this side of the atom is going to be positively charged because this side is going to pull the electron that way. Now when they're shared evenly, those are what we refer to as nonpolar. So if we were to draw kind of a representative electron cloud, it's going to be equal in size because no one's going to win the tug of war. All right, now here's another ionic versus covalent. I should have flip-flopped this title up here because over here you have the sharing of electrons. And we go back to kind of the Bohr planetary model to oversimplify. It looks like the paths are overlapping. So here is a covalent bond, which we have also learned as a molecule. And then over here we have the transfer of electrons where an electron is actually donated and given away right and that results in an ionic bond because you have the positively charged cation the negatively charged anion that are attracted to one another <clears throat> now again we're kind of lying to you in separating these these categories they really kind of fall somewhere in between but but we can group them based on electronegativities because it makes it easier now the type of bond depends on the elements differences in electronegativities so if the difference in electronegativity, we have 0.3 and 1.7 here as these cutoffs. When there's a small difference, nonpolar, the electrons again are shared equally. Polar covalent is between 0.3 and 1.7. They're shared unequally, so someone's going to win the tug of war. And then ionic bonding, there's such a difference in electronegativity that someone's actually going to pluck an electron away from each other, where an electron is actually transferred to another atom, and you end up with an ion, a negatively charged and a positively charged ion, which is the attraction up here. We also refer to this as having increasing ionic character, which makes sense. If 
if a bond is ionic, it has a large amount of ionic character. If the bond is covalent, polar or non, it has a pretty low amount of ionic character. <clears throat> Again, this is just a chart here that shows you when the ionic is greater than 1.7, polar covalent is somewhere in the middle of those cutoffs, and nonpolar covalent is 0.3. Now when it's right on the line, just put it in both categories, because we're really taking a big large spectrum and arbitrarily kind of assigning numbers, but you can um, still put them into those groups. Now for electronegativity, if we remember from our periodic trends from last unit, um, as you go across a period, electronegativity values increase, and as you go down, they decrease. Now the other thing that's special about electronegativity is that fluorine is the most electronegative atom. Um, the trend doesn't totally apply to noble gases, that's what's missing, and that's solely because um, noble gases don't share their electrons. So we're going to use electronegativity values to determine, determine if something is ionic, polar covalent, or nonpolar covalent. Now, you'll have a chart, and you will have received a chart by now, um, and you have to fill these numbers in, you don't have them. But if you find sulfur and hydrogen on your electronegativity chart, and you won't have to memorize electronegativities, they'll be given to you. You find the difference is 0.4, which puts it into the polar covalent category. Okay, Then you get to sulfur and cesium, and the difference is 1.8, and we always make these numbers positive. Okay, Sometimes we have to rearrange them, um, but you always want to make it a positive number. It doesn't have to be a negative number. That one's going to be ionic, and then the difference between carbon and chlorine is 0.5, which is also polar covalent. And these three up here are just another representation. Here is nonpolar covalent. Okay, here is a polar covalent bond because you have a negative end and a positive end, and then here's your ionic bond because things um, have transferred an electron and there's a positive and negative charge. Bad writing there, sorry about that. Okay, a couple more examples. Between chlorine and calcium, it's an ionic. Between chlorine and oxygen, it's going to be polar covalent. Between chlorine and bromine, it's less than 0.3, so it's nonpolar covalent. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, here's that picture. Up here you've got the non, here you've got polar, and here you've got ionic. So this is what this one would look like. This is what this one would look like. And this is what this one would look like you could draw representative electron clouds. All right, now some patterns. These are big. You don't have everything written down on this slide either, so make sure that you jot this down. When we combine metals and metals and nonmetals, we almost always form an ionic bond. Okay, so that's why it's been hugely important to label the parts of the periodic table and be familiar with what's in a metal and a nonmetal because we're going to find out in the next unit it also dictates naming. Uh, nonmetals and nonmetals are covalently bonded. Okay, and last but not least, we'll cover this later in the unit, but the other combination, metal and metal, is going to be a metallic bond. And this is going to be really important because we're going to do naming, and then we're going to talk about the three types of bonds in detail, and then we'll look at shapes and geometry. Okay, 